Hey, this is Jeff Lavery and Larson Way talking this week at the Common Gear podcast. We look at three notable auction sales from the predominant digital auction platforms. And with this week's episode, we're looking at a theme of interesting drop top cruisers and they're kind of across the spectrum. And what we've noticed about these, the, the results are a little bit surprising. If maybe not what you'd expect, you kind of, when you see what we see, you might expect them to be flipped around. And actually the top dog this week is a car that uh, many might've considered sort of past this prime or that potential buyers were aging out of the, uh, out, out of the hobby, but these results show us otherwise. So with all that being said, um, we're going to kick off and talk about our first car this week, a 1962 Ford Thunderbird Sports Roadster that sold for a heady $55,500. This is a, a true mileage unknown car, but the condition seems to support the fact that the 90000 may be accurate. It has the venerable Ford 390 under the hood, which is, I believe, a... Uh, maybe not a standard engine option. I'm not quite sure, but in either way, th this is a nicely equipped example. Uh, one of the best colors out there, Rangoon Red over a white interior. Yeah, it looks to be a very original car, right down to the um, you know the wire style wheels with the spinner style or knockoff style uh, hubcaps or center caps, and uh, an unrestored interior that's still holding up uh, quite nicely. This is, you know, perhaps one of the more classic American roadsters, uh, American convertibles out there. And uh, I was, you know, you know, pleased to see that this car did as well as it did, because there's been a lot said about the fact that these older American vehicles are, you know, sort of past their point near the past their prime, right? The collectors who treasured them are aging out of the hobby, but um, it's probably just more that there's a little more discretion in this arena right now whereby uh, collectors can say, no, I'm not going to just spend crazy money on the first thing that comes along. I'm going to wait for a really uh, well-preserved or well-presented example, which this car certainly seems to be. And as you look down some of the other options, it has the you know, uh, factory air conditioning. It is a sports roadster it's equipped with a tonneau cover, which um, I'm guessing might be a, an upgrade or an option of some kind. And obviously you have the documentation side of it, including the factory build sheet and the original invoice. So uh, it seems like a great result for this car. Lars, uh, what, what did you like about it? What, why did you uh, flag this one this week? Yeah, so uh, I, I like your point, Jeff, about I, I agree with it, too. I think that at one point these might actually come back up in value. Um, when they kind of become like a novelty of just, you know, obscurity and rarity. Not that they're not already a novelty. These cars are coming up on, you know, 70 years old. But what I was thinking with today's picks is we were kind of talking about convertibles. And I was going to do like, you know, a BMW, Audi and Mercedes convertible, talk about those. But what I really wanted to do this week is talk about different experiences you can have with these open air cars. Because, um, you know, convertibles are one thing and an open air experience is one thing. But depending on if it's in a sports car, a four by four truck or an old classic like this, you know, it's going to be a very different experience. I think this is honestly kind of a slam and deal for what it is. Um, I could probably think of a few less car, a few cars for you know fifty fifty five thousand that are a lot less exciting. Um, mm -hmm. This one looks to be in really good condition. It's not fast by any means, even though it has that three ninety V eight. But just looking at this thing, it's an American icon. The interior, the gauges, the steering wheel. I like the fact that everything about this car is again. I'm going to use that word. It's so obscure. It's so different. And even though you know, the guys who wanted these when they were 20 years old at this point, you know, they're 80, 90, right? They're kind of getting out of the game of buying these vehicles. But it almost surprises me that these don't go for a little bit more. Now, I'm sure I could find an example of a Thunderbird that's, you know, into the six-figure range, you know, one with a rare engine and transmission and option list. But I think this is a really cool, and we're talking about convertibles and open air, I think this is a phenomenal choice you know, cruise this thing down to the beach, cruise it on, you know, Main Street, whatever boulevard in downtown. Really, really cool car. The smells, the carbureted V8, these things, I mean, they're four-seaters, but they're like 200 inches long. They're as long as like a newer generation truck. 
Right. So just just something with a ton of road presence um, and a really, really cool cruiser, 50K. It's a total collector's piece. And look at the pictures. I mean, this thing's mint. I think this is a pretty good buy. I, yeah, I, I like the quality. Really I, and there, I think what you're going to see is it's going to transition away from the, um, you know, the buyer being the, like you said, the the guy who in high school wanted this car, and, you know, much like you and I, you know, salivate over the cars we, we wanted when we were younger. But I think this is going to transition from being that kind of like an emotional purchase to more just a status, a status buy, right? Because it, it's, it's, it's a bit of a, a rolling piece of artwork, right? So I could even 100%. see see some of the new new generation of buyers are not buying it because they have some sort of ethereal connection to the car more just it's like hey that thing looks like a spaceship on four wheels from the 1960s and it's just going to start a conversation wherever it goes so i I think these you know you know these are becoming more of a um you know a, a, a purchase based on appearance only rather than a purchase based on it's you know achieving a lifelong dream of owning a car like this i mean i look at the back end of this thing and there's a whole generation of car enthusiasts who have no connection to this car they didn't see it at the july 4th parade when they were kids like i did you know they're not buying it because of something that they remembered as, as a child they're buying it because they're like well look, look, look at this there's nothing else like it on the road and it's gonna it's gonna blow up my instagram feed it's gonna get um you know it, it's gonna be used to go out it right it, it's uh you know it, it's just being used for different reasons rather than just going to the uh the local car show now i could be completely wrong in terms of who the buyer is but i, I do think in general you're going to see some of these American land yachts transition to a, a new type of buyer who's just buying it for the, the visual wow uh, rather than some uh, some emotional connection to the make or the model. So either way, you know, the, the comments indicate this was a great, a great price for this car. Um, and, you know, yeah, people uh, are people are, you know, they're hyping this one up. And yeah, it's like everyone's I mean, a fan. It, everyone's a fan, but it, not that many people actually want to step up to the plate. And I mean, there's a few different bidders on here, but not too many. No, not know? too many. It was just it was a small group, but a small group of very committed buyers. So uh, good for good for the seller, I, I suspect. Uh, and I, I had I misspoke. Apparently, this car has far more restoration work in it than I initially thought, which is a testament to whoever restored it because it does not look overly restored. It looks very original. Uh, just while also having been completely gone through, so kudos to the the uh, the shop that did that work, or if the seller did it, good good on him. So yeah, great great number for a car that many probably written off as not really being capable of pulling this kind of kind of, kind of money these days. Uh, let's jump on to our second one, which is another classic, but one in a in a totally different light. The 1971 Ford Bronco four speed. This is actually, I think, a really a good buy, an excellent buy at thirty thousand one hundred for a, um, a a dry looks like a desert truck. It has a four speed manual, which you don't always see in these. With obviously the classic three or two V eight, and I mean this thing, the, the looks are dead on. It's like if you were going to build one of these, this is exactly how you want it to look. The you know yep. olive, you know the, the olive drab green paint job is just a total bonus. I, I love the way they did this with the black steel wheels, the black bikini top. And the green, you know, forest green paint. I probably would have done right here. I would have done like a black bench seat if it were mine. But uh, this looks like the kind of a very smart build because they didn't um, they didn't really fix anything that that, need, that didn't need to be fixed. So they 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 kept the investment low and just made this thing it's something you can actually use the way God intended, which is becoming a, a rarity these days in the, in the vintage four by four market. I do know, you know, it looks like with an awesome original color, this just sort of grabber orange uh, paint job. Uh, it, I'd be tempted to um, go back to that because it is a great color on these. It but, is, uh, yeah, agreed. But yeah, Calypso Coral. So, I mean, that's such a cool color, but either way, um, this, this is to me is just a screaming bargain. And honestly, I think you could, you could use it as completely as is and make your money back in five years, or you could do a proper paint job on it, bring it back to the original color and, and probably not lose any money on it there either. And increase the sale price by a significant amount to, uh, to justify that work. So 
I, yeah, this is just one of those, those trucks that it doesn't matter where it is or how it's used. It's just always going to be one of the coolest four by fours ever made. What do you think Lars? Yeah. And, and, and that's kind of a point I wanted to touch on too. This is definitely one of those things. I mean, to be honest, a, a lot of the stuff we look at is it falls under this category, but this is definitely something you could buy drive for four or five years. And it's always going to be kind of that special commodity. And right. I'm a little biased. I grew up, my dad was into Jeeps. I was into Jeeps. I had a 93 um, in high school, my first car. I would take the top off in the summer. That first day it was warm, even if it was in March and it was premature. I would always take the top and doors off. And I just think these, you know, kind of square body, short wheelbase, rugged four by four the with a stick. The fact that this thing's a V8 makes it all the better. Um, that lumpy idle with that open air experience, which is the theme of this week's picks. I actually think this might be, and you guys, obviously you'll see in the next one, but I think out of the three we have this week, this would probably be my pick, you know, not considering price or resale or anything, but just to drive and enjoy as my vehicle. You know, if I had a sports car, I had an SUV, I had a touring car and it it is something for the summer. I'd probably choose this just because I love the character these have, you know, no top, you hear those loud kind of knobby tires, mm-hmm. carbureted V8, <laughs> all the wind. There's zero aerodynamics. So right. you, you hear everything. They handle like shit, you know, all over the road. The steering doesn't do anything, but that's part of it. Right. That's part of driving these old things. We had a um, a customer trade in one of these very similar, you know, like a resto mod with a 302 crate engine. Um Man, that thing was a handful to drive. You know, yeah. the the shift action is really long, and it's a big truck transmission. Just so full of character, these things. And oh, I didn't, I didn't notice that. <laughs> I will say that. Oh, I will say, you're commenting on the price. I was struggling to find this. You know, '70s generation of Bronco. You can easily find one for six figures. Oh if yeah. This thing is perfect. It would be 70, 80 grand. If the seats were perfect and it was really repainted, you know, all panels, it would be 70, 80 grand. <clears throat> and like you said, uh, these things you kind of want to beat on. You want to drive them onto the beach and throw them in four-wheel drive and kind of spin the tires a little bit, kick up some rocks. So right. having a mint one isn't that's a hundred K might not be the move, but I like this one. This might be my favorite of the bunch. And that yeah. classic Bronco badge. You're seeing oh, yeah. that on all these people today. They're getting that badge on their new Broncos. On the new ones. I hate it. I it's, hate it. This is a, this is where it actually came from. It's classic. I know. I'm just like, go out and buy the real thing. Don't just buy a badge, but whatever. That's, uh, yeah, I mean, this <laughs> this, this thing is, um, and I, I, I just think this was an, a really smart buy by the, uh, the top bidder. I, I don't see how you go wrong with this. And um, I'm just curious what they've, what the commentary was, but I think um, exceeding my budget, you know, some people are saying it's a little more expensive, but I don't know, like you said, you don't have to look that hard to find these things going for 60, 70, 80,000. So no. uh, it, this is just a, a excellent buy and, you know, just in time for summer. So um, yeah, I'm a big fan of this one too. I don't know if I'm going to call it my favorite yet, but um, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely a truck that you know, especially compared to what some of the the uh, the K five Blazers and Land Cruiser the FJ forties are going for. This just still seems like such a great price across the board. So that excellent buy by the buyer there. Yeah. Um, all right, our third and final. Also, oh real yeah, quick, go ahead. Though, real quick, this is. I mean, you might agree with me on this. Something I just want to throw out there. Sometimes I feel dumb. Not dumb. But sometimes I feel like I might not be like historically correct because like, for example, this and the Thunderbird are just two examples. But mm-hmm. um, it's like how a, you know, 2009 E92 M3 with no track, with no performance pack, no carbon roof, all the nav is worth way less than a 2011 carbon roof track pack coupe stick E92 M3, right? Mm-hmm. And we know that we can look at the two and say, yeah, that one's worth way more on the, you know, on the auction sites. But the average person who's not in the M3s or BMWs, they might not even know. They just see them as the same car. So right. I want to throw out maybe the reason this one's cheap and that Thunderbird was kind of cheap is because 
you know, it's not a desirable year or not a desirable engine or transmission. So I might be off base with that, but I just, <laughs> I just want it to be said in case there's any yeah. diehard fans watching that are like, well, that's a first year and it had the bad engine and the, didn't right. have the revised front bumpers, you know, so who knows? Yeah, I, I, and I give, you know, domestic car buyers a lot of credit because they, they know those factors inside and out. I think particularly the Thunderbird, you know, there were definitely um, more desirable years because of engine options. I, you know, I, I want to set the 428 with an option and that's, you know, that's a car you might spend all the money on. Um, 390. Exactly. You know, exactly. It's a great motor, but it wasn't necessarily exotic in a Thunderbird. Maybe it was exotic in a Mustang of the same generation. But um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely something to be said for the fact that um, you know, and also think about your typical Bronco buyer. Like a lot of them these days, they want the resto mod, right? They want the one that feels completely modern inside and looks completely retro. So Again, that new age buyer may say, you know what? I, it doesn't matter that it's, it's 50 grand less than a resto modded one. I want my Bluetooth. I want the modern transmission. I want a brand new crate engine. I want a leather interior with heated seats. So the fact that this one was just sort of authentically raw, yeah, it, it probably turned people off, which I will never understand that mentality, but it's it's becoming fairly, uh, fairly, uh, pronounced out there that that people want resto mods more than they want an original uh car or truck especially one that had a tendency to build a little rough around the edges so um hmm. but that's yeah, just that's fair point. on my end uh all right let's look at our final final car which takes us into the modern era so this is a 2008 m3 convertible 43,000 miles rare and desirable six speed Manual transmission sold for a very reasonable thirty-four thousand dollars. This is a, um, you know, this to me is a car you use every day. It has the S sixty-five V eight, which, um, you know, if you were to find a hard top version of this car with the six speed with this kind of mileage, it would be way more expensive. So the convertible in this instance offers a little bit of a, a cost savings, I think, for the near identical experience, aside from maybe the loss of some structural rigidity. But as we know, with this era of the convertible, it has a retractable hard top. So you're really not losing as much as you used to. You know, I had a 99 E36 M3 convertible, which was a little bit of a rare bird because it did have the five speed manual. The, um, the convertibles are often bought by people who aren't necessarily uh, performance minded, right? It's more of a cruiser, it's more of a retirement present to take you down to Palm Beach. So to see one of these with the six speed and the V8, I mean, this is actually kind of, you know, when you sent this over, I wasn't really that enthusiastic about it. But the more I look at it, more I'm kind of like, actually, this is a, a little bit of a sleeper, um, a sleeper buy right? Because you're getting perhaps one of the more desirable M3 configurations with that glorious X65 V8 for quite a cost savings, um, simply because it's a soft top. Well, not really, but it's, it's a retractable hard top model. And you still have three pedals, no bullshit, SMG, whatever, whatever was, you know, the option for a F1 style gearbox on these cars. So I, um, you know, I don't think it'd be like my pick for the week, but I think this is still a really smart buy by the uh, the top bidder. What do you think? Crap, man. I dis I disagree. Uh oh. Uh oh. Whole- Dude. Okay. So here's my thoughts. Right. So I love, I love, love, love the E92 M3. Even I love the E90 as well. I think one of the better drive trains. That's going to be a cre- in twenty years, man. We're going to talk about that drive train, the S65. Oh yeah, four liter revving up to 8,250 8, RPM. It, it and when I'm in a better position, that's probably hopefully one of the next cars. You know, I'll buy yeah. in the near future or yep. the foreseeable future. I'll say, um, would love to own one one day. But it's almost like when I think about an M3, especially this generation. I kind of think of like precision, tight, really enthusiastic performance driving. But when I think of a convertible or something open air, I almost think and associate it with the exact opposite. Cruising, relaxing. I'm not driving the convertible to beat on it on a back road or go quick on on ramps. I kind of just want to, you know, have the music up, enjoy myself. Mm -hmm. 
be able to shift gears if I want. But I think for me now, I'm not saying it's not a good buy because you're right. It's it's an 08. It is a first year, first year of the uh, E92 M3. Um, I don't really think they have that many issues anyways, but you know, you always want the late model in theory. Yeah. Right. But it's a six speed. It's low miles. It was definitely, like you said, whoever owned this 43 K mile or 43,000 miles, it was definitely taken care of. But when we're just talking about the theme, so I think it was a great buy, but when we're just talking about the theme of the week, I think I actually don't necessarily like those convertible or even the hard top convertible sports cars. I just, Oh yeah. You know, and it, it adds weight. It takes away rigidity. And at that point it's like, well, why am I even getting an M3 then? Right. You know, you could get like a, uh, I don't know, like one of those Mercedes SUVs and just totally cruising that thing. But so, uh, yeah, still a I good deal. Still a yeah. good deal because you have that S65 right behind your head, revenue eight grand, no top. That's mm-hmm. that could sell me. That could definitely sell me. Also, I hate to say, it, I just got to throw it in. Yeah, <laughs> you're gonna kill me, Jeff. You're gonna kill me. Oh God! Uh, in the E9, I'm a diehard manual. Hashtag save the manuals. I would take a DCT and an E92 M3. It's the one <laughs> car. It's the one car. It's the one car. Because I don't understand, I don't understand why. But why? What is that? What is that getting you? I, mean, I don't even understand why. That Dude, you gotta exists. watch. You gotta watch the videos. It just, oh, oh what? And it and it snaps. It sounds like a whip. These things with, with the DCT, and it grabs another gear at eight grand. Oh, it's it snaps into the. You just keep grabbing a gear, grabbing a gear, grabbing a gear. Downshift, 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 and it yeah. sounds like whips. And then it breaks. No, I know, I know, but you know what, man? No, they're not that bad. You get a, you know, you get a transmission pump, yeah. you know, 50, 60 K. I'll send, so, no, I'll send you a video tonight of what I'm, it's all right. Dude, it I'm sounds happy. like an F1 car. But I will say, I do agree with you on, I mean, that was sort of why I didn't love, yeah, you know, I bought that E36 M3 convertible to replace my departed E36 M3 hardtop. And I was kind of like, what is the point of this car? Like, it, you know, and that's an older one by a long shot. So it, it you know, the, 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 the structure just shook and trembled. And um, even with the hard top on it, it wasn't really that compelling of a, of a car to, you know, in terms of the, from the handling perspective. And I was just always kind of like, I don't, it's not really a sports car anymore. It's the convertible, but I don't really like convertibles. So why do I have this car? Um, out of the three we've got here, I would absolutely go with the, um, the Thunderbird, which is valid, very valid. You know, I blame the Dakota, uh, RT for having that influence on me now where I'm like, I like just turning something on that's got the V8 burble. It just sounds good. It just rolls down the road, making that noise. Everybody looks at it. Everybody thinks it's something menacing or, you know, high performance, what have you. And um, there's something uniquely American about that. And, uh, you know, that Thunderbird is, you know, I'm one of those kind of new age buyers where I have no emotional connection to it. But I like it because they have never made cars that look like that since then. And they will never make cars that look like that again. And, you know, those are the types of things that from an investment perspective uh, are always going to do well because they're just, it's, it's a once in a lifetime phase that has come and gone, isn't coming back. You know, that was peak. That was when America was excited about everything. Like that was peak Jetsons age possibilities. Like you see that in the styling. And um, I love that, that attitude of just, um, optimism, right? And I think that the, the car like the Thunderbird convertible absolutely captures that 100%. So that gets my vote. I appreciate you putting that in this week because I wouldn't have picked it myself. But when I saw it, I was like, you know what? That is something I can get behind. So good, 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 good on you for throwing that into the mix. Yeah, I, th- I think we had some fun ones this week. Definitely not our best week, but it was kind of a cool discussion to have and, you know, compare the different, uh, you know, top down open air experiences with these three. 
Yeah, no, and uh, we, you know, we we certainly missed our friend John the night, but he's got a lot going on with uh, the arrival of his first child that's coming about a month and a half earlier than expected. So uh, thoughts are with oh, him. Yeah, good for him. You know, he's uh, his life is changing quicker than he was expecting, but uh, he'll he'll hopefully be back on the next week or two, and. Right on. You know, I uh, I think we had a, a solid discussion tonight, certainly about, you know, when it comes to a convertible soft top purchase, there's really, you know, a lot of things that go into it. And uh, in this day and age, you know, I think we both agree, given your choice with the Bronco, mine with the Thunderbird, if you're going to buy a convertible, buy a convertible that does what a convertible does best. So uh, while this, this, this M3 is a compelling buy, it's certainly not what I would say is the smartest buy in the top top world. So that's what I got to say about that. Yeah. I'll close on this. I actually looking back, I, I was probably a little harsh on the M3 because you yeah. know, man, scroll back up for a sec so I can see it. Yeah, man. It's, I mean, come on. It would definitely be a lot of fun to drive, especially with some mufflers on there. That's a sick car and it's very low mileage. And it looks great. It but does. For some reason, it just doesn't. Um. No, I, like, not like an E ninety two M three coupe with the carbon roof and you know in frozen white. That screams to me. The convertible, not so much. And See, this one, I mean, this is look at the thing. Yeah, I mean that's what that's what I come back to. If, I'm, if you're going to buy a convertible, buy a convertible. And, and those uh, seats, you'd melt into those seats. You know, and this 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 cockpit is there's like there's nothing else no other error uh comes close to this kind of design nope. you know they were there there was really no uh no restraint shown in making it as off the wall you, you know again like i said space age influence was just through the roof on these cars so um you know even if with that e9 that m3 being an absolutely phenomenal driver's car uh, I, you know what keep your role holding abilities give me something that like this, which is just was built for cruising. I mean, just think about that. Think about that that mindset, right? Of a of a company saying, "We're going to build a car that is just an epic cruiser." Like that's you know, do we make we we literally we don't make cars like that anymore. No no car yeah. has such a <laughs> unique mission as something like this. And and it, I'm sure at the time you're like, oh yeah, it's got phenomenal handling by the standard 1962 domestic products but you know but people were they they were still buying because they just wanted that great open air open road experience and again i go back to that optimism we were feeling at the time where you, you could make cars for just that kind of pointless mission of cruising uh and now you know we can't do that we can't do that because we're too worried about what the the, the economy rating is going to be. We're too worried about whether you know the battery pack can explode. Or whatever, whatever it is, it, you know, we've gone into a, a you know a, a real rabbit hole of, of concerns. But um, this this car to me, you know, these days just means something so much more than it ever did before. So um, we're down to probably about thirty seconds. So I'm going to wrap yep, up. I was just going to say. Thank you, Lars. This has been the Common Gear Podcast. Feel free to check out our site at thecommongear.com where you can easily track and store all your records pertaining to your collector or vintage car. And we'll see you back here next week for our next edition of the Common Gear Podcast. Thanks, everyone. Cheers.